Good afternoon. Welcome to Iron and Cold's November Special Edition webinar. My clock says 3 p.m. Eastern Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so may, very much for joining us today. My name is Ashley Jones, and I am the program manager here at INA Cole, and I'm so happy to open today's webinar. Before we turn it over to our presenters, we wanted to um, present you with a couple administrative items to go through. So at the bottom left-hand corner, you will see a chat box where we will encourage you all, as Chris mentioned earlier, to introduce yourselves. Um, and start a lively, engaging discussion today, and also share any insights as we go along. We will also pause at times throughout the webinar to pose questions to you guys, and also ask for any feedback on anything that's important to you guys. And also, um, of course, time for Q&A. So please be sure to ask your questions, and we'll do, the be do our best to get those answered for you. Also, you can use um, Twitter to share what you are learning with hashtag meeting students where they are. And be sure to connect with us also with um, our Twitter handle, which is uh, at NACOL, N-A-C-O-L. And be sure to share insights on there as well. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived on INACOL's website, so we will send you a follow-up email within the next few days with a link where you will be able to download the slides and also listen to the webinar recording and revisit the discussions. If you do have any audio issues, you can let me know, which is INA Cool Administrator, and I will let you guys uh, run through a audio setup wizard, and hopefully we will have that set up for you. We are grateful to have today Antonio Rudenstein, Sydney Schaefe, and Chris Sturgis here with us to have a conversation about what it means to meet students where they are in a competency-based model. So with that, I will hand it over to Chris Sturgis. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley and hello everybody. Um, so let me get us here. So I'm going to just do, talk about what competency-based education is for a few minutes just to make sure if there's anybody totally new to competency-based ed, we always do this just to make sure um, that you understand the context that we are talking about it. So uh, with the help of a, about 100 plus people from around the country, we've developed 10 distinguishing features of competency-based education. And they're organized around purpose and culture, uh, pedagogy, and structure. So when we think about purpose and culture, uh, the three uh, features, the first one is that student success outcomes are designed around preparation for college, career, and lifelong learning. Well, we hear the rhetoric of college and career all the time, but we're much more precise about that. We really believe that kids need to have lifelong learning skills. Those are the same as the building blocks for learning. It's grit, it's perseverance, it's having um, agency and the metacognition, self-regulation, all those pieces that allow us to manage our learning. Um, we want to make sure we kids have academic knowledge and skills, but the third piece is to be able to actually transfer and apply those skills. So that's sometimes called 21st century skills, sometimes transferable skills. But when we start to design a school around that corpus, it, it really pushes us in new directions of really demanding deeper learning and performance-based assessments. Second one is that districts and schools make a commitment to be responsible for all students mastering learning expectations. Some people think about this as literally embedding accountability into the school itself, not expecting the state uh, policies to force accountability, but it's really taking responsibility. But of course, teachers can't do that alone. It has to be a school-wide effort or even district-wide effort to be able to make sure that kids get the support they need and that schools are really responsive. If kids have a gap, the responsibility is to actually repair that learning. The third one is district and schools nurture empowering inclusive cultures of learning. And this is so important because the science of learning tells us that kids need to feel safe. They need to feel like they're belonging. And if we're going to have students have agency, if we're going to have students have voice, if we're going to have students being able to shape the environment in the classrooms and um, build that community of learning, then of course teachers have to be more empowered, which means principals and superintendents need to have strategy, leadership strategies that really empower um, the organization. So there's a change in culture. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's an important piece to keep nurturing as you move forward in competency-based ed. Now, when we talk about pedagogy, some people like to describe this as something new, and other people say, and told me, Chris, this is just about effective pedagogy. And I, I really found that this is a helpful way of thinking about it. So one 
very basic thing is that kids receive timely and differentiated instruction and support. Um, now, what that might mean is that somebody is several years behind what their grade level expectation is, is they may be rece receiving lots of extra support. It's not that their pace is slower. They're actually learning a much greater distance along the continuum of standards, right? So what we, we try to think about it is meeting kids where they are, but not don't always drop them to the lowest level. It's really thinking strategically about how, what's the best way to optimize learning. And one of the basic things we see in competency-based schools is that there is some time, if not every day, frequently throughout the week, that's free and open for kids to get the support they need so that they don't have to wait to get help. A second part is that it's research-informed pedagogical principles that emphasize meeting students where they are and building intrinsic motivation. And what this means is, instead of thinking of kids as empty vessels, we really have embraced the science of learning, which says kids are Learning requires you to be active. And so what we want is kids to be putting forth their best effort, and they, we do that by thinking about how to motivate and how to engage kids and how to develop their intrinsic motivation of what's important to them and what their education can mean to them. So uh, there's lot, lots of pieces to that, uh, but we've really seen that the field of science of learning is making great steps in starting to integrate both the cognitive and psychological um, research findings, and that's going to make a real difference for educators. Uh, the third one, assessments are embedded in the personalized learning cycle and aligned to outcomes, including the transfer of knowledge and skills. Now, this some people describe this as instead of emphasizing summative or evaluation um, date, uh, assessments, we're really now starting to see assessments as a cycle of learning, and that kids have a real role in this ass assessment. When they're getting productive feedback, those assessments are really helpful to them. I like to think of it as assessing as a verb instead of assessments as a noun. And I think that helps make the shift to um, really seeing it as a valuable part of the learning process itself. And then when we go to structure, there's four pieces. So one is that there's mechanisms are in place to ensure consistency and expectations of what it means to master knowledge and skills. And this is probably one of the weakest areas in the American education system. Uh, in other countries, there's a heavier emphasis in moderation, which means making sure that one teacher in one classroom and another teacher in another classroom in that school or even a school across the state are actually, when they're saying a student is proficient at eighth grade math, that, they, that there's consistency across that. Because one of the biggest places inequity walks in the door of our school system is when we start to kind of say to a student, oh, sure, you're, you're proficient. I'm going to give you a B for effort. But the student actually hasn't learned what they needed to learn. And then now we've set them up for failure, and we've made it harder for the next teacher who's going to teach that student. So that consistency is very, very important. Schools and districts value transparency with clear and explicit expectations of what is to be learned, the level of perform performance of, for mastery, and how students are progressing. And you'll hear this described as the competency framework. Now, be careful. Don't just replace your standards with the word competency. Competencies are higher level, and it's really about outlining a vision of what students um, should know and be able to do. And those standards are many of the pieces that will help kids build up those competencies. What the transparency is important is that kids start to understand what is expected of them. They've seen examples of student work. They know where they are in their process of learning. And this is also where the concept of grading starts to shift, and I'm going to sh move right into that. But when the expectations are transparent and the scoring is based on the actual standards and on those competence, the progress towards the competencies, then all of a sudden this becomes very motivating for kids because they, they start to understand what they're able to do and what's expected of them. So now the ninth uh, feature is strategies for communication progress support the learning process and student success. And we really encourage people, don't shift into a change in your grading policy until you have lots and lots of other pieces in place. But there will become a point where the, the traditional grading system will get in your way because it's not based on really helping students understand what they need to do differently. 
Um, it's based so much more on the summative um, assessments. And once you start to shift more and more to formative assessments, you really don't need that A through F grading. What you're going to want is a scoring system that helps students know what they need to do in order um, to master the materials. And then finally, this has been a big shift in our understanding. Um, the tenth one is learners advance based on attainment of learning expectations or mastery through personalized learning pathways. And we used to talk about um, competency-based education as advancement upon demonstrated mastery as the first thing. And what we found is that, A, people jumped to thinking it was only about pace and self-pacing, which really was not the core concept at all. But the other part is that we've learned that this is really a culminating capacity that gets developed over time. When you have consistency in expectations, when kids are receiving plenty of support, when um, the, the school system's been able to organize themselves so that they can think more deeply about um, giving students agency, organizing the learning experiences so it's enhancing engagement and motivation, all those pieces together really um, build up into these personalized learning pathways. So there's the big picture of competency-based education. And I am now going to turn it over to Antonia and Sydney. And I just want to say, I have to give them just the biggest shout out because um, redesign has played just an instrumental uh, role in the National Summit on K-12 Competency-Based Education. And these are two of my favorite go-to people when I'm trying to understand different aspects of competency-based education myself. They're my gurus. And they will um, take us away. And please do put any of your questions in the chat room, and we'll stop twice. Uh, to be able to answer those questions. So just type them on in, and then we'll ask them when we take a break. OK, Antonia and Sydney, I am clicking off my talk button, and you get to click yours on. Great. Hi, everybody. Oh, um, I'm Antonia I'm Liebenstein. I'm the founder um, and director of Redesign. And I'm um, working on thinking about these issues um, with Chris and with Sydney, who's my colleague at Redesign, has been um, one of the great uh, joys of my work over the last couple of years. Um, and Sydney, why don't you, I'll just give you a minute to introduce yourself as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to, to be with you here today. Um, and as Antonia said, I'm, I'm a colleague of hers at Redesign and um, excited to jump in. Great. Um, Sydney and I have both been working in the competency-based learning space for quite a few years, and it's been very exciting to kind of see the field evolving and see the work that is happening at greater and greater scale um, nationally. And when we, um, the way we've come to this work is really from thinking about the relationship between teachers and young people. So when we do work in schools, in districts, um, or even at the state level, the place where we start and where we try and end and be in between and, and all the spaces in between is really thinking about, is this making, more, making things clearer, more supportive, more engaging, and more authentic for young people? And is it helping teachers in ways that will allow that to happen? And so we don't begin with policy. Uh, and we don't begin with um, kind of some of the external systems, like Chris mentioned, such as the grading policy. We really begin with what does this look like in real time between teachers and learners in the classroom. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the paper that we worked on um, and, and then give a couple of examples of for us, what this can begin to look like. I'm going to just jump us to the next slide. When we wrote the paper, meaning students where they are, we the 10 distinguishing features of competency-based learning had not yet been developed. They were developed out of this, not out of our work per se, but out of this summit work that we were all participating in. When Sydney and I went to try and work through what today would look like, we, we planned today as a way to try and bring the threads of the 10 distinguishing features 
into the presentation today. They're not in the paper in this way, but we want to, we are working in our own work to bridge the distinction between the old way of kind of defining CDL and this new set of distinguishing features and trying to help us all kind of begin to um, incorporate these 10 distinguishing features into our language and, and ways of thinking. So, so that's, so the paper is structured in these three, around these three questions. How do we know where our students are? What do we do once we know? And how do we navigate system constraints? And we take, you know, so this obviously could be several volumes of a book, but we've tried to condense it down. What we want to do today is talk about what does it mean for these questions to be answered in the context of things? How does, what does it mean for things to be relational, pedagogical, and structural in CDL? And so we're going to move back and forth between the sections of the paper and these distinguishing features. I want to stop there um, just for a second. Okay. Um, just want to make sure there's not a lot of questions yet. All right, so let's jump in. Um, the first element which we we talk about is relational. How does CDL change the relationships? How does it allow teachers and students to come closer together or allow students to come closer to each other? And in the paper we talk about a few different things. Um, we talk about the ways in which um, as one shifts the classroom around competencies, it allows us to begin to understand students as full beings with full experiences that they're bringing into the classroom that is um, contributing to their learning and sometimes hindering their learning, sometimes allowing them to move really quickly in some areas and less quickly in others. And it, begins the, the development of competencies and learning progressions allows us to begin thinking about students' full selves along a set of learning progressions that lead towards competency. And so we begin to have a, rather than a sense of this student is good at something or not good at something, or this student um, uh, has learned something and is done, we begin moving towards if we know what expertise looks like in across a lot of different indicators, what do we be, how can we begin to support um, the, the, the jagged profile as Todd Rose, who's a researcher, writes about that students have strengths in some areas, gaps in others. Um, so that's the first aspect of meeting students where they are. It's first actually one, understanding who they are and knowing them, and then two, beginning to understand not just who they are as individuals, but who they are as learners in a much more complex way than we have typically understood. Let's talk about the pedagogy. This is the place where redesign has put much more um, of our, of much of the center of our work. So this idea that um, students are going to be learners, um, that are going to lead their learning, is an idea that is more and more talked about in the field, but it still, still has not fully achieved existence in, um, in our class, in most classrooms, not in all classrooms. And it's a really challenging piece of work to think about and begins, um, challenges a lot of how we were taught, obviously, and how we, um, how we then teach. Um, it, uh, and again, without the relational aspect of this work where we really, really get to know who our students are, it's hard to figure out how you would construct a path with, with them instead of for them um, and figure out what, how to how to envision, help them envision where they are moving. Um, and again, learning progressions can really, really do support this work because it makes, as Chris was describing, it makes the learning expectations and, um, and what the path could look like very transparent and explicit. And we're going to give an example of that in a few minutes. 
the third area for us to talk about, or that we talk about in the paper, is structural shifts. And some of these are ones that we all have read about and potentially even experimented with, the idea that you'd use time in flexible ways, that you'd create buildings that were not just cells and bells, um, that you would uh, use staffing in, in, in ways that are not as traditional um, with one teacher in a classroom with a group of kids for a year, that you would begin to rethink about ways that um, you'd move you'd move potentially beyond the walls of the classroom and also beyond the limits of a school day and a school year. Because in a competency-based system, you would be needing to look for what students need to learn next, not this is the day the marking period ends or this is the day the school year ends and so learning is going to stop. Um, so you would be constantly looking for ways to create the next learning opportunity for students and it would we would begin to push on the structures that we've all come to sort of navigate within and um, and begin really thinking outside of those those walls. That's a very brief overview. What is, I, we're going to spend the rest of the day, pretty much, or the rest of the hour, looking at, so what, is this, what does that really mean? Like, that's a lot of overview, and that's a lot of kind of, you know, high-level stuff. What can this look like? What does this actually mean? And I'm going to lead us briefly into one part of the paper, and then um, Sydney is going to bring us into a couple of case studies so we can really look at, so how, what does this begin to look like? So one of the, a couple of the distinguishing features of CBL is that there is a learning cycle that is personalized and that um, is visible to students and begins to structure um, the learning experience for students, but while also achieving an opportunity for them to create their own path or at least co-construct a path with their teacher or with their peers. And it redesigned what we've what we've posited is a powerful model for the this learning cycle is that we begin by making it inquiry based. It's really all about trying to understand something important that's going on um, in the world or or in the or in past history. And that it that the process is really about bringing students through an experience that allows them to do something that's authentic, that is mapped backwards from college and career readiness, not from your high school year, if, you know, not from your senior year of high school, but literally, what do you need to do when you get to college? And that, um, that allows students to engage in the authentic work of actually creating things, designing things, sharing them out in the, in the broader world. And that once you move into this sort of experience, you have something that is worth, a, one, you've made the assessment of something that is um, the learning, and two, you've made the work that students are doing something that is worth becoming competent in and, and worthy of their effort towards competence. So that's sort of our basic assumption is that the first step is to get to something that is worthy of students' efforts around, of, around becoming competent. And then the second is for it to mirror um, the kinds of things that students, that adults do either in their professional lives or minimally that college students do in their studies. And so this, this cycle has these two elements to it. In the micro, students are in a, a process of making meaning digging into new material, building their background knowledge, activating their prior knowledge, getting some schema in their mind. The making meaning process is all about getting your schema activated and hooking, hooking new learning onto existing um, nodes, basically. And that from there, you're ready to do some investigation. And investigation is literally pursuing your questions, your wonderings, your interests related to this topic of study. And as you're investigating, you move, I'm going to move in the inner circle here to synthesize and reflect. You're constantly in the practice of learning, of synthesizing what you're learning, tying it back to what you already know, 
updating and revising your own assumptions about what you're seeing in the world. That's the inner circle. That could happen in a given day. It could happen over a period of two or three days. It could happen within a week. The time, it's not so much about a particular period of time, except it's the small version of learning um, that we all do in order as we explore new things. The larger version is that collection of experiences, making, getting, investigating, and synthesize flows into this outer circle. So you're, you'll go through that process as you investigate a larger phenomenon or historical event or a major world problem. And then from there, you'll create and design something. It could be something that the teacher assigns and says, you know, this is something we're going to work on together collectively, um, designing a water filter for a community or uh, putting on a, a, a community event. Um, or it could be something that the students create and design as they, as they often can based on what they um, and with either with whatever level of support's needed. And then the final section of this work is that you put it out into the world, that it's not just something you submit to your teacher between you and your teacher, but that it actually has a larger purpose um, that creates some incentive and momentum around truly getting to mastery, um, getting to, to some level of competence where one is can legitimately put something out into the world. That's the learning cycle. And um, we want to now take you into an example, a small example of that at play. And then we'll take some questions. And then we'll go from there into another case study if we have time. But um, we will pace ourselves according to the questions and the time. All right. So Sydney, do you want to take it away? Yes. Great. So let's look at the learning cycle in action. Um, I'm going to share a brief story about a teacher um, whom we'll call Miss Oliver, and whom I had the privilege of doing a short study with earlier this year. Uh, Miss Oliver and I worked together to design a series of lessons or learning experiences. So we're in the sort of inner uh, cycle or inner circle of the learning cycle. Um, and this was for her high school social studies class. In, a, in an initial goal setting conversation um, that launched our collaboration, she mentioned to me that she really wanted to see her students take more ownership in their learning. Um, and one of the ways we decided to explore this question of ownership was to design some choices together and layer those into her lessons and study the student response. One such lesson involved students choosing from three different primary texts. This was um, in the context of studying post-Civil War, the post-Civil War American experience. And students were asked to choose um, different primary texts that offered different perspectives um, on their post-Civil War experience. Um, what a Black Man Wants by Frederick Douglass was one option, Triumph uh, from a personal diary, and a third text entitled Conquer. Um, so Ms. Oliver, so we'll, we'll, we'll situate ourselves in the Make Meaning Circle here. She launched her lesson. She did a little framing. She made some connections to previous learning. She built some sort of shared background knowledge for students. And then she launched them into their text choices. Her plan for the investigate stage of the learning experience or lesson um, was to have students do the reading, annotate the text, and then engage in first a discussion with other peers who had selected that same point of view, and she offered some prompts for that. Um, and then she had students move into triads where students could explore different perspectives together in conversation, and again, provided some prompts for that. And on a typical day, that would be it, right? The bell would ring, <laughs> the activity's over, and kids head out the door. Um, but in our design together, we really wanted to make sure we, we closed the loop of the learning cycle, the, that inner cycle. Um, and so we designed a, or crafted a synthesis prompt for kids and a reflection prompt for kids and made sure that they had sufficient time to do some thinking and respond to that prompt um, before, before class was out. Um, and just to sort of uh, make sure we have a shared understanding for us, when we think about crafting a synthesis prompt for students, um, we think about asking them to articulate their, their new understanding or their new insight, as Antonia shared. 
Um, so sort of before I thought this and now I'm thinking of it this way. Um, as an example, and then a reflection prompt is one in which we're asking students to, to sort of pause and consider something about their learning process. Um, maybe it's who they worked with, maybe it's what went well or didn't, maybe, you know, something they, a decision they made in their learning they might do differently in the future. In this particular lesson, we simply wanted to ask students about the choice they made um, and why they made it. So, again, very, very simple. Uh, simple sort of choice design, if you will. And um, let me share uh, some of the responses. So we, we gathered these, these open-ended open responses. We coded their responses. And what we found was 68% of students either made a choice of their resource because they found it relevant or because Ms. Oliver had done such a great job of, of sort of framing and teeing up the experience that there was a lot of situational interest for kids. Um, I'll share uh, some of these um, some of these responses that that, that kids made uh, to this question about why they made their choice. One student said, um, "Who chose what a black man wants?" By Frederick Douglass said, "I think talking about black society is good because people always find a way to let us down." Another student who chose the Concord text said, "I wanted to understand what the Southern feeling was and how they reacted to it." Another student said, I made this choice because it's the article which had spoken deeply to me. Another student said, I love Frederick Douglass's poems and felt like I would connect and understand his speech better. So with a very simple question, we were able to get some really interesting insight on what connections kids were making, what rationale they had for their choice, and also get to know a little bit more about our students through those responses. But what really puzzled us, and we've highlighted this in green, is that 14% of students said they just made a random choice. Just made a random choice. And we found, we found this really puzzling. And so we wanted to follow up with, with these students um, in different ways and also explore this question uh, further around how students respond to choices um, and, in, and in particular, how they experience choices in learning. Um, so we, we actually ended up serving 104 uh, students who were all in Ms. Oliver's class. And we asked them, if you had more choices in your learning, how would you anticipate that that would change your learning experience? And you won't be surprised that 90% of kids responded by saying they would anticipate something positive um, would uh, change in their, in their learning experience. So that some kids cited they'd be more motivated, they, would, they felt things would be more relevant to them, their voices would be heard, they'd be more focused, um, they would have a better attitude. I mean, all of these really positive responses. But 5% of kids anticipated a negative response if they were given more choices in learning. I'm going to share a few of those um, survey responses on the left here. So some, you know, one student said, I would respond negatively because too many choices are overwhelming. Another student said, if they were given the choice, they wouldn't do anything. Another student said, I might make the wrong choice. So you can start to see some of the thinking that students have about their own decision making capabilities. Of course, we pushed in further and we interviewed some of the students who shared some of these concerns that more choice would be a negative experience for them. And one student who we'll call, who we'll call Chris said this to me, I like having the choices, but I feel like it would have been easier or better or more constructive if the teacher gave the choice or, in other words, made the choice for me. Because then, like, if the teacher gave you the choice, you would have, like, a set focus on what you're going to do. Like if she gave the option, I feel like you might think about the different choices you could make too much or longer. I'm just curious, um, when you read that response, what, what comes up for you? What, what's happening for Chris as he's thinking about his choice? Feel free to drop a response. We'd love to hear what you think. Um, it, it seems that Chris has, is feeling pretty intimidated about uh, making certain choices in, in his own learning. And he gives us, he gives, gives us real insight into his, his own sense or, or sort of lack of confidence in his, you know, sort of his toolkit, his ability to make these choices. Um, yeah, passive learner. Yeah, he's, he's not, he doesn't feel comfortable sitting in the driver's seat. Um, too many choices can put demands on working knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's a cognitive load piece here. Um, that may overwhelm. Yeah, dependent learner, great. So it's interesting because Ms. Oliver had raised this question at the beginning of our study and saying, I want kids to have more ownership. 
Um, wonderful. Thanks for your thanks for your responses. Um, and it just strikes me that what if we had never closed the loop? What if we had never posed the synthesis and reflection question to, to gather these insights on the student experience and, uh, and really give us, you know, really important data that we don't typically gather um, that really helps us, you know, as we were, uh, Antonio was talking about the relational aspect of CBE, the pedagogical um, uh, uh, decisions that are involved in, in, in competency-based education. This is it. This is sort of a, um, an example of how um, closing the loop, right, use, we use this learning cycle to guide our design, um, and it gave us really wonderful insight that not only helped us get to know our students um, uh, better, um, but also gave us insight into something we can now, we can now you know, make an instructional move to support Chris. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, again, that's sort of just the power of closing the loop and the power of using this learning cycle as a heuristic. It's not a perfect tool, um, but it's a good one. And I think, um, you know, we wanted to, to pause and, and provide an example of, um, you know, the power of using the, this sort of visual representation of the learning process to make sure that we, um, we provide kids with uh, rich and deep learning experiences. And now, again, as I said, we have qualitative data, we have important data on the student experience that can help inform our next pedagogical moves. Now, we're very limited in time today, so we won't, we won't get in, um, we won't elaborate further on some of those, um, on some of those pieces. But again, we wanted to use this little, little study as an example of the power of um, designing around this learning cycle um, and some of the, inter the intersections that we see with, with questions of ownership and co-construction. Um, now, let me take a moment here to pause and invite you to um, pose any questions that come to mind at this, at this stage before we move on to a second uh, case study that we hope will help illuminate some of these ideas um, from the paper. Sydney, so, there's one question that's not quite on this case study, but I think we can change it. The question came from Susan. She um, wanted to know the um, Susan Fine um, about how you introduce kids. And let's take high school. You've got a group of ninth graders coming in who have never been in a competency-based school, aren't familiar with these types of pedagogical cycles. How do you um, help onboard them to this uh, this whole experience of being in a competency-based school and understand the approach? Any That's such that? a wonderful, such a wonderful question. I'm going to drop um, a resource that we'll point to uh, uh, later when we get into to, um, a case study on competencies. But essentially, and Antonia, feel free to jump in here. But um, where we've seen this go really well is first of all where there's transparency, and that's one of the, the you know the powerful things about starting with the learning cycle as a way to communicate what is going to shift in the learning experience and helping kids understand at whatever developmental stage they are what it means to make meaning. And so as Antonia described, that is when students uh, are making connections to what they already know. Um, they might be generating their own questions about the, the topic. Um, they're, you know, with, with guidance, they're, they're building their background knowledge. Making those processes, those important things that happen in our learning, um, making those transparent to students is incredibly powerful and arguably one of the first things we must do in order to really shift um, to a model that's nurturing learner agency and, and uh, creating the conditions for student ownership. This is not a switch you turn on and off. Student ownership is, must be designed for, and I think one of the ways we do that is to make, to make the process transparent. Um, Redesign has put together a staging guide to support um, maybe Antonio, that's something we could we could drop um, and share with folks. But a, a staging guide for thinking about um, sort of where to start on your journey, um, and and it's definitely not <laughs> when I've seen this go very wrong. Um, describing the the ideal state of the system, um, and it's such that you know you you describe all these new and different things that will happen, and really change takes time, and it is a it is a deep multi-year process. Um, and so we we encourage folks to start with 
you know, small strategic um, uh, uh, components of the work. And one of those is introducing the learning cycle because it's visual and it anchors teachers' teachers' curriculum design. It provides guidance for even, as I just illustrated, you know, a quality learning experience and how to design one. And, and tuning kids into that process can help them begin to locate themselves. It creates an opportunity to prompt their metacognition. Was I able to make the connections? Um, was I able to, uh, you know, respond to the synthesis prompt or did I get stuck? Was I not able to articulate my new understanding? Um, so I think as much transparency as we can, and again, the learning cycle I think is a great place to start. I've seen people make posters of this. If, you know, they might print out the learning cycle. They might, they might make their own with kids. They scaffold learning experiences around the different stages. They, you know, point to it as they're starting to model this type of learning experience design. Um, and as Antonia mentioned, you know, you know, grounding the learning in inquiry, grounding the learning in authentic performance assessments. Um, you know, that's another really important piece um, in terms of curriculum and pedagogy to focus on. So anyway, those are some ideas. And we're, well, I'm, I just, again, I shared a resource that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but as, mu as much transparency as we can make, as, um, as clear and measured as we can be uh, and accurate about what's going to change um, and, and not using jargon, uh, you know, particularly with, with parents, um, but being really clear about your student's going to get more feedback on their work and they're going to be expected to engage in a revision process with that feedback before, you know, they, they finalize their, their summative assessment or whatever. Um, being really concrete about what changes um, and really specific, I think, in addition to this idea of transparency and then sort of designing a rollout. Um, Antonia, is there anything you'd add to that? No, I, um, I, I, I see there is a new question here. Um, that I, I just want to make sure we touch base on as well sure. and we can move on. Um, so there's a question here about learning requirements and how to make them feel like they're related to the real world. And um, I'm not sure exactly if you meet by learning requirements what exactly you're referring to and I want to make sure I do. Um, but what I would say is what we've tried to do is and I think the next case study in some ways will help with that because we're going to share a little bit about um, a, a way to think about competencies and learning progressions that's a little bit different than um, what is what is often um, what's often figured out when we think about competencies and learning progressions. So we're, might share that, but it and that allows things to become more real world more rapidly. But the thing that we have typically done is when use the learning cycle to get to something authentic. And so we start by thinking about well, what do we want students to create and design? And sometimes it can be literally the things they're going to do in college. They're going to learn how to do a multimedia presentation, which is also done in the professional world, or they're going to learn how to write an argument in a essay, which is not done in the professional world, but often people do need to persuade others to a certain way of doing things. So that's a real world connection. Um, there's certainly lots of design tasks. So we, we think, we try and think very carefully about that create and design aspect of the learning cycle and then map our way back to that so that all the learning that leads up to it is, um, is in service of something that students can see is real. Um, and then if they need to communicate it out in the world, it immediately, the, the, the ways in which it has a um, utilitarian value become immediate, becomes immediately clear to students. And it looks like Sydney just posted some open source projects that we developed that were, that use the learning cycle as their frame. This is Chris. I suggest we get to case study two, and I think some of Let's this will do it. make real quick connections. Great. Yeah, great. That sounds great. I just want to I just want to quickly name what was next step for Chris. So two things. One, we talked about um, metacognitive modeling. Um, so supporting Chris in seeing a quote unquote expert um, go through the process of making a decision. What do you think about when you're making a decision? Um, what strategies do you do do you use? What do you get stuck? So sort of modeling for for Chris um, the process, and then designing 
more tightly sort of bounded choices that that don't feel overwhelming to him and prompting him to reflect on that experience and sort of using that as, you know, sort of an ongoing inquiry into how to support Chris. So again, we'll go into a lot of detail, but modeling was a big piece, prompting reflection and being really thoughtful about des uh, choice design. Um, okay, cool. So study, case study number two, um, we want to dig into this question around how do we know where students are? Um, and in particular, um, you know, in the paper we talk quite a bit about sort of the, the importance of moving away from all these structures in the system that are really based on, you know, ages, uh, grade levels, um, and, you know, uh, uh, cohort models, um, and thinking about a much more sort of um, coherent, responsive uh, system for learners. And one of the ways that we do that and, and that um, we're, we're seeing lots of movement in the field around um, is the sort of the, the role of competency design in, in fostering some shifts. I would say along all, actually all three dimensions, relational, pedagogical, and structural. So this, um, this slide shows uh, at the top a set of competencies that Redesign uh, just recently had the privilege of um, developing in partnership with the state of South Carolina. Reading critically, expressing ideas, investigating through inquiry, reasoning quantitatively, designing solutions, building networks, using sources, learning independently, leading teams, navigating conflict, sustaining wellness, and engaging as a, as a citizen. These 12 competencies, as you can tell, are not discipline specific. They are cross-cutting. And they bring together both academic and efficacy uh, capabilities um, that, are, that are based on, uh, you know, qu quite a bit of research um, from, you know, uh, industry analysis and sort of the, the skills that are essential for the fastest growing jobs to child development literature. Of course, they've been informed um, by, you know, nationally valued standard sets as well. Um, but essentially, these are the 12 that, that map backward, uh, um, or map onto, I should say, the South Carolina um, profile of a graduate. Um, and, uh, and essentially, this is a, you know, now a state-level learning system. And these are a prototype. They've just been developed, and they'll be field tested this year. But they follow a particular design. Um, they are not power standards-ish. Um, they are intended to be a... Um, uh, a continuum, basically, a skill continuum that describes in transparent language and as best we can student-friendly language what the sort of novice to expert uh, trajectory is for learners around these essential skill sets or capabilities. Um, and each competency is made up of a nested set of essential skills um, and each one, or skill components, and each one of those skill components has sort of a, a continuum. Um, in this case, I believe we have six, six performance levels. Importantly, as we mentioned in the paper, they are not attached to grade levels. Students are where they are, and we know that. Um, uh, as Antonia said, and I think mentioned in the paper, there's no third grade brain. Um, and so can we have a set of tools that breaks us out of the, um, the, the sort of grade-based model and um, gives us a flexible tool and, as Chris mentioned, a stable set of criteria a consistent set of expectations that we can use to truly locate where students are and monitor their growth. And so we want to take a look um, at what this looks like in practice. So we've been doing some work with, with our friends in South Carolina, um, and we use the example we're going to look at to sort of sh sh explore the relationship between competencies and standards, but also how to use the, the competencies um, continuum. So in this case, we're, we're going to take a quick look at a few science standards. Um, and in particular, I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead what we've done here, and we did this with, with some of our, our friends and, and colleagues in South Carolina, we took the academic standards for science investigation pulled right from the state, um, and we, uh, we laid them out on this sort of continuum, and we, we excerpt, so the kinder standards, the K3, K6, 8, and then biology. And if you look at these standards, you'll notice they all refer to students either conducting or planning in conducting a scientific investigation. But what's shifting in the standard language? Do teachers have guidance on how the skills of planning and conducting an investigation become more sophisticated with practice and at higher levels, at higher performance levels? What guidance do teachers have? What is really shifting in the language here, as you'll notice, is what content is to be addressed at particular grade levels. 
So in kindergarten, we're exploring, well, we're conducting investigations. Um, so at the kindergarten level, we're not doing the planning to determine what plants need to live and grow. When we get up to biology, we're planning and conducting investigations to determine how various environmental factors affect enzyme activity and the rate of biochemical reactions. But what about the skill development? Uh, in, in comes our, our continuum. So the, the continuum that we've developed for investigating through inquiry has several different sub-skills. Uh, sub I think Antonia will drop the link, if she hasn't already, to the, um, to the South Carolina prototype competencies. What I want to point out to you is just one particular skill, um, the first skill component of this, of this uh, competency, which is frame a research question. Now, if you use you know, science uh, standards or you look at science, uh, science standards, um, again, we didn't have, we weren't given much guidance um, in how these skills develop. If, if you take a look, and maybe we can just do a, a quick moment to, to read across, um, what we have here is a set of performance levels that describe, for students, how this skill evolves at higher levels of com complexity. Um, so we start out in level one with guidance. I can notice things around me and then come up with a question to learn more about a topic or about the way something works. And then in level two, you're able to use your observations to come up with a specific question. And in level three, you're using observations to come up with a testable question that addresses a problem or topic you're investigating and citing the sources that you've used to explore the problem or topic. Um, and you can see as you continue to go, um, the skill is described in greater, uh, at greater levels of complexity. Um, so for teachers, what does this mean? Um, the first thing it means is, um, in order to create opportunities for students to apply these skills, we've got to design the right assessments, right? And you'll see, you know, um, that uh, in, many, in many sort of lab experiences for students, they're really not being asked to, to make the observations, to frame the research question. Um, in many instances, they're being asked to follow a set of procedures. Um, for a lab report. So we're really positioning learners here as developing experts. How do you frame a research question? Well, we use observation, et cetera. Um, so that's the first. We design learning experiences so that students have the opportunity to develop and apply these skills. Um, but secondly, these uh, performance uh, descriptors um, provide explicit guidance to teachers on um, how to teach these skills and support students, how to locate students where they are in the continuum. Um, and, uh, and then finally, to use this to give students feedback. Um, and we've set up a little example here of um, uh, uh, two students who come up with their own question, um, and we, we can use the continuum to offer, um, to do some analysis and think about um, where students are. So in the first one, why did my bicycle get so rusty last summer? Why won't the rust come off? Um, if, we, we, if we had more time, and I, I, I'm afraid we, um, we don't in this moment, maybe we'll open up this up for questions in just a moment. Um, but we could use students' thinking to do some reflection. What stands out about each learner's research question? What does the research question tell us about each level's, learner's level of understanding? And what feedback would we use, or give, I'm sorry, to each student to move them on to the next level um, using the continuum? I'm going to uh, pause there and um, and, and open this up for questions um, specifically around the, the impact of sort of this, this approach to competency design. Um, and I, I want to emphasize actually real quickly the, the, the point of having this stable set of criteria. In many instances, we see teachers um, writing their own rubrics uh, for different tasks. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a model in which, you know, an entire team, in, in fact, an entire state could be using the same set of criteria and now we have an incredibly powerful way to measure longitudinal growth. Um, data no longer has to be locked into a grade or a class, um, but we actually have a way now, a stable tool for measuring growth um, over the course of students' uh, learning journey um, in, a, in a competency-based learning system. So I'll pause there and, uh, and we'll take some questions. So I'm going to ask you one. Um, I did, is uh, so I, I I think one of the challenging questions still for so many people is so you're in high school and you've got a student 
let's say, who's reading at sixth grade level, and you're in a tenth grade, you're a tenth grade teacher. How do you handle that? You can be in any um, course, but you've got a student who's just challenged that way. Could you just describe how you would handle it? If a student is reading, I'm sorry, reading below, reading like four grade levels below. I mean, they can read, yeah. they can decipher, but they're um, they're they're not strong in comprehension. They're yeah. weak on engaging with the text, and yeah. their vocabulary is low. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So um, this is, I think, the power of uh, of a competency-based learning system where um, we're able to, <laughs> per the paper's title, really meet students where they are. Um, we're not, uh, we're not um, designing a lesson or learning experience for, um, you know, for the middle, um, but we're using tools to locate where that student is and determine what is needed to support their reading level. This student could still participate um, in a, you know, in a, going back to our learning cycle, an investigation or, I'm sorry, um, uh, a unit of study, let's say, where they're engaging in these high-level um, experiences, but we're able to provide supports for that for that student based on where they are with their particular reading level. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't mean that students have to be excluded from you know critical thinking and high you know or high-order thinking experiences. And in fact, um, I'll point you to our reading critically um, continuum that again provides a, a stable um, set of of performance expectations for teachers to think about how can I teach students one of the one of the skills in the reading critically competency is choosing and applying strategies um, as uh, while reading and so um, and of course as I said they're they're um, informed by uh, you know nationally valued standard sets the the descriptions and that reading critically competency um, but you know really it's about and this is you know this is, this is I think why it's so complex is really being able to diagnose what students' uh, needs are and respond to those, um, uh, you know, in the context of you know deep and meaningful learning that they're that they're doing. Antonia, is there anything you would add to that? No, no. Yeah. Um, um, are there any other questions? Would be. Let's see what I'm looking here. Yeah. Um, Steve has just asked the question, how do you think this uh, applies beyond K-12 education and post, into post-secondary and lifelong learning? And then we're going to have to wrap up after that question. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's, it completely applies. I mean, I, lo I feel like even as an adult, we can look at how we navigate conflict or we can look at how we sustain our wellness. We can look at how we're engaging as a citizen, and we can sort of use indicators along the way to help us understand um, either if we if that's an area we want to take on, um, how to do that. I do. You know, it's interesting. I've been involved with the starting to get involved with the project with SNHU and um, an effort around badging for um, kids in youth employment programs. And this type of set of competencies uh, is actually something that can extend, I think Steve, you're really hitting on this, can extend across careers and, and employment opportunities as well into post into college environments and beyond. And so when we get the right mix of competencies, then I think that we can start to see uh, a system that will extend well beyond K-12 and can kind of almost become culturally language we use and understand to talk about this transition to an adulthood and what kids need. Um, yeah. And I think this is a great list to keep going. So I'm going to just move us and thank you guys. Um, there are Antonia and Sydney's emails if you want to have any follow-up, and we've uh, given you information about redesign, and I just want to say these guys, have, you know, they're working with South Carolina. They've been very influential in Idaho as well. And um, if you have any other ideas you want to share or if you want to write for Competency Works, there's my email. 
And I thank you all for taking an hour out of your day to come talk with us about meeting kids where they are. And Antonia and Sydney, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.